we all ask the question, why do we suffer? And we all do. Uh, some seem to suffer more than others, and some seem to go through life with hardly any suffering. But in actual fact, we nearly all suffer at some point in our lives. We cannot escape it altogether. I want to talk about a, a Jamaican tragedy. This took place a long time ago. On the left is the school that I taught at many years ago in Jamaica on the west coast, on the northwest coast. Um, just at the right, you can see that there are some gates there. And there was, in actual fact, a gate post. And on the right hand picture, you can see a picture of a Jamaican bus, uh, fairly typical. And it was not dissimilar to the bus that came to collect the children one day. And one young lady, uh, she was called Colleen Crooks, was standing next to the gate post as the bus swung through the uh, gate's way uh, to reverse and she was crushed between the um, gate and the bus uh, with obviously uh, fatal uh, outcomes. Um, and and the, the suffering that was there, obviously, uh, Colleen lost her life, her parents, and, and, and particularly I, her grandmother I knew very well, uh, were absolutely devastated. Uh, her friends and her, uh, her school all uh, were, were very affected. I, I never want to have to be in a situation like that again. And we might say, well, why did God allow it? Why, why did God let that happen? Uh, and, and people did ask the question. I, and, and if you think about it, what was the Lord God to do about it? Was he to move Colleen as the bus approached um, she had uh, free will she'd been told that it wasn't a good idea to stand where the bus was coming but she was chatting to her friends and oblivious to what was happening was the Lord God to, to move the bus the bus in actual fact never drove uh, into the gates ever again whilst I was working at the school was he to move the gate post? He had been there a long time uh, and uh, remained there. Would we expect God to do any of those things? Would we expect him to, to um, make things different uh, in, in some way? It was not the Lord God who was responsible for that directly. Um, it, it was, if you like, a combination between the uh, the bus driver and Colleen and uh, uh, the, the gates uh, and so on. So we all endure the agony of suffering. And it's not just physical suffering, is it? Um, I didn't suffer physically at that time, but I know that the anguish carried on for uh, many, many weeks and months. And often it's the mental agony that is the most difficult. And the suffering of others can affect us. We, we might look at uh, what's going on in different parts of the world uh, and we can be uh, taken um, with what's happened uh, and we wonder. So we'll try and just look at it this afternoon. Um, and I'm not going to be able to guarantee to give any answers to why we suffer, but just perhaps a few pointers that we can bear in mind uh, as we try and face up to this subject. And I want to think first of all about two friends, and I've deliberately called them friend one and friend two, I don't want them identified. Friend one was married with two young daughters, and in January 1947, when he was uh, 19, when he was about 46 years of age, he died from esophageal cancer. And someone wrote of him to see his care and concern in action, always to be able to see the good and to suffer wrong without murmuring, was a great lesson, certainly was to me. And I lost that friend and uh, couldn't understand why. 
Um, and then only a little bit later in the second year, uh, the second friend um, died of pneumonia after uh, an operation. He was 56. He had a wife and two daughters. He had, uh, it, it said, a meticulous eye for detail and a prodigious capacity for hard work. It was a joy to serve with him. They were both Christadelphian brothers uh, and they were both particularly close friends. And I still have to say, I do not understand why either of them was taken. I'm able to accept uh, and to accept that the Lord God is right uh, and therefore it, it must have been right that they were taken. But I confess that I don't understand why. And perhaps that's one of the things that a little bit later in God's kingdom, I might be able to understand. So we may not be able to understand all the causes of suffering. But the Bible does set out a framework which begins to allow us to come to terms with suffering. And uh, we, we need to go back right to the beginning. Uh, I think all of the Bible quotations this afternoon are on the screen. If you want to follow them in your own Bible, that's fine. We start in Genesis chapter one, where we're told that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And later at the end of that chapter, we're told that God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. In the evening and there was morning the sixth day. So right at the end of God's creative work, uh, we're told that everything that God made was, was very good. Uh, but there, there was very quickly a problem with that very goodness. Uh, and we, we need to look at what went wrong. And we've only got to progress through the Bible to the third chapter of Genesis to discover that Adam and Eve, the first uh, man and wife that were made, uh, had been given very clear instructions that they could eat all the trees in the Garden of Eden except one. Uh, and they knew which one it was. It was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, and that was the one that they wanted. And I suppose that's like us all, isn't it? We, we, we're quite happy not to do the things that uh, we, um, we, we, we are not interested in. But someone says, don't do that. And we've almost immediately got to try it. What, what happens if we do this that I've been told not to do? And both Adam and Eve were punished as God said they would be. Uh, first of all, the woman was punished, Eve. Uh, this is the Lord God through the angel speaking to the woman. He said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Well, we know that that's true. Uh, women have pain in, in childbearing and uh, uh, that continues. Modern medicine has to some extent mitigated some of the worst effects, uh, but it's still uh, a, an episode which can bring complications, uh, pain and sometimes even death. Uh, but there was more condemnation. It wasn't just to, um, to Eve that God spoke. He also spoke to Adam because although Eve perhaps was the first to sin, Adam was certainly involved. So verses 17 to 19 of Genesis chapter 3 say, to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Well, God had made Adam of the dust of the ground. Adam was told that if he sinned, he was going to die. 
And although he didn't become, uh, didn't die exactly the same day, from that very moment, he became a dying creature. He, he uh, began to suffer all the things that go with being a dying creature. And we know that that's true. Uh, eventually, uh, our breath stops and we return to the ground. Uh, and we become just like the dust. So Adam and Eve had gone against God. They had done what they wanted to. And because of that, there were consequences. Um, it, it's the record in Genesis chapters one and two uh, is quite condensed, um, uh, but it does seem to indicate that although they had to work the work was not onerous. It was possible uh, and, and it was pleasant. But God says, following that, uh, it, work's going to be difficult. Um, the ground is going to bring forth what it describes as thorns and thistles, the sort of weeds that get in the way. Um, and uh, it was going to be hard work to produce the food uh, that man was going to eat. Uh, and eventually death would overtake him. Uh, now, we might think, well, that's just what the Old Testament says. Uh, and people do sometimes say, well, we, we, we need to look at the, uh, the New Testament. That's much more encouraging. Well, in actual fact, it's just not true. Um, the letter which the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans is just as... Um, sharp in what it says it's just as straightforward it says if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man jesus christ it carries on in verse 19 for as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. So the Apostle Paul in, in Romans is supporting exactly what the Genesis record says. It says that sin and death came into the world because of the sin of Adam and Eve. And we all follow that and therefore we all die. And because we're all dying creatures, we suffer the consequences of being dying creatures we get older we find that we're not able to do the things that we used to be able to do and we find that we are uh, beginning to uh, well i suppose wear out would be the uh, the, 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 the uh, easiest term to describe it so romans continues in that fifth chapter that we've already quoted as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So perhaps the thing which Romans particularly picks up on is that there's hope. In actual fact, of course, there was hope in Genesis. Uh, we, we haven't looked at it, uh, but it wouldn't be right to say there wasn't hope. God suggested that uh, sin would continue to be a problem until uh, until the, the right one came. And we're going to see who that is in a minute. But first of all, we're going to uh, um, look just for a moment at some of the issues. Um, just think of the world we live in. We live in a world of cause and effect, uh, consequences that may be inescapable. Uh, fire burns, uh, that can be good if we're using it to heat things uh, or, or perhaps uh, treat things uh, uh, in a laboratory, but, but it can have problems if it gets out of hand. Water can support life in so many ways, but if we go underwater, we can drown. Uh, disease co is caused by germs which destroy and we've We've seen the effect of that when disease gets out of hand with the recent uh, COVID uh, problems. 
So without restrictions, things like this just would be going on unchecked. We could all do exactly as we liked and not worry about any of the consequences. Um, you, you could touch something that was hot uh, and you, you, you might not realise unless you had the sensation of pain uh, that you needed to take your hand away. Uh, and we need to see also that man's ne neglect and misuse of life corrupts not only himself, but also has consequences for future generations. The, the COP26 um, Congress has just concluded the conference to try and resolve issues of global warming. Now, I'm not going to comment on uh, whether they're going to be successful, but one of the reasons that we seem to have the problem of global warming is that we've quite happily used things like fossil fuels to do all sorts of things with, regardless of the consequences. And now there are far too many of the uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere for our good. Um, we're probably beginning to get more sunlight uh, getting through than used to. So we are subject to the effects of sunlight and that can cause uh, cancers. Uh, we are all suffering the effects of global warming. And they're worried that if the temperature rises too much, then so much ice is going to melt from the polar regions that uh, some of the low-lying areas of the world will just be lost forever. Things that we do have their consequences. Uh, and the consequences of man's act are not confined just to the physical. The, the social and political evils have left a burden on following generations. One of the things that uh, has been particularly uh, in the news uh, over the last few months is the way that women are often treated. Uh, and that's because of the way that men have been allowed to think about the, the way women should be treated. And, and then the thinking becomes action. Uh, and, and so we, we're caught, aren't we, in a, a, a net of past history and trying to get uh, to the way in which we should view evil and wickedness and the way we should treat one another. So let's look at a case study, please. And it's the example of Job. Job is the book that comes in the Bible before the Psalms. Uh, and it's quite a long book, one of the longer books of the Bible. Uh, and very simply, Job was struck with a whole variety of problems. He lost seven sons and three daughters at a stroke, uh, not to mention sheep, camels and other livestock. Uh, and in case we should think that that's not so much of a problem, Remember that that's the equivalent these days of, of losing your bank balance. Uh, and, and he had to recognise that all he had came from God. His family were there because God had given him a family. Uh, and if God chose to take it away, then God had the right to do so. So let's have a little look at some of the things that Job says. This is at the end of the first chapter, chapter 1 and verse 21. Job said, Naked came I from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that was uh, very balanced and, and very perceptive of Job. But when he began to suffer even more, he he began to perhaps be a little more um, acerbic in what he said. He, he said to his wife, who, who said that she, he should curse God and die. He said, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? So he's very straight about that. Uh, God, God is right and therefore 
if we receive what we deem as evil from God, then there's a good reason for it. And so right up to that point, Job didn't sin with his lips. Could we look just for a moment at uh, a, a, another verse in, in Job? If you've got your Bibles, it's Job chapter 2. I'd like to read the verse before uh, chapter, uh, verse 10. Job chapter 2 and verse 9. Job 2 and verse 9. His wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. He, he wasn't going to. His wife suggested a course of action. But Job's response was to set out the principle which is true for all time. We can receive good from God and we can also receive evil. <coughs> and it is god's wisdom to tell us what is right for us and at the end of his suffering uh when we've read through all of the other uh, 41 chapters we come to this in chapter 42 job confesses that what his suffering has made him do is to understand god a little better i had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eye sees you. Therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. God is seeing that God is the one who's in control and he does everything for our ultimate good. So let's move on a little further into uh, the New Testament. Uh, and look for a moment at that um, chapter that we read a little earlier with our, our president. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 12, in actual fact, is, is quoting from the Old Testament. So we see that, that the way in which the two are linked together. Uh, and Hebrews chapter 12 quotes Proverbs chapter 3. In actual fact, uh, a lot of the letter of Hebrews uh, does quote from the Old Testament. So the, the, the reader is addressed uh, like this. You have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. Uh, and here it quotes from Proverbs. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. And it's giving us the picture of parents who try to discipline their children. <coughs> um, and, and that's what we do. Um, if you have seen a child who's been allowed to do everything they like and given no uh, correction no boundaries then that child can be quite difficult so we try and stop them um, one way or another and so the the writer to the hebrews says <coughs> it is for discipline that you have to endure god is treating you as sons <coughs> and that's a lovely idea what the writer is saying is that God is caring for us in the same way as a wise father looks after his children. What son is there whom his father does not discipline? And I thought <coughs> we could say that's true for daughters also. If you're left without discipline, in which all have participated, then your illegitimate, illegitimate children are not sons. So God. <coughs> provides discipline for us and suffering is part of that discipline so you see we've reinforced this close link between the old and the new testament 
they're telling the same story. They're telling the same idea. <coughs> they are telling the same thing, perhaps in slightly different language, using different pictures, but they're telling the same thing. And so the writer of the Hebrews goes on. Um, like this, <coughs> same chapter. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands, strengthen your weak knees, and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame <coughs> may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. It's telling us that suffering and loss are the common lot of all. But God's people use suffering as part of their spiritual training. They use it to learn the sort of, <coughs> excuse me, the sort of person that God is. And the, the, the writer says, make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. God wants us to follow him. He wants us to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to learn the lessons. And sooner or later, for all of us, there will be this time when we are able to, uh, to learn and to be peaceful because of what we've learned of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, moving on a little to words of the Lord Jesus. Now, when we look at the life of the Lord Jesus, we realise that very early on, he realised that he was likely to suffer an agonising death uh, on the cross at the end of his life. Um, although he wasn't in himself sinful. And he knew all about that. Now, just listen to what he, he says. This is from John chapter 3. We're going to read verses 14 to 17. Jesus says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Uh, now, it takes us back to an incident when Moses had had to make a brass serpent or have one made it was because the people had been bitten by serpents snakes that had caused them terrible problems and many of them had died and what happened was that if you looked at this brass serpent then you would live and jesus says in just the way that that brass serpent was put on a pole and raised up <clears throat> so I'm going to be uh, put on the cross so that those who are sinful can have eternal life. Now, more words from Jesus. Not only has he promised that uh, those who are uh, affected by his sacrifice uh, should not perish but have eternal life so jesus later said greater love has no one than this that someone lay down his life for his friends just think what that actually meant um just think what that really meant here's a a bit of a reconstruction of what it might have been like 
in the front of that picture, we can see the crown of thorns that was put on Jesus before he was taken to be crucified. And the thorns went a few little um, branches from a rose bush that would have dug in but not been too bad. These were real savage thorns. Uh, there would probably have been a lot of loss of blood just caused from that. And the nails would have been great Roman nails, which you can probably see just in the uh, background of that picture. Uh, somewhere between six and nine inches long and quite thick. Driven with a hammer through the hands and the feet. And then he would have been left on the cross. Jesus knew that that was going to happen to him, and yet he still went on in his life doing what he thought was right. And what about his father, the Lord God? How did he feel when the Lord Jesus suffered like that? Any father suffers when his son or daughter suffers and a mother also but we're talking about the lord god he suffered knowing that there was no other way that men and women could be ransomed and saved and it was all foretold here's what the prophet isaiah says in all their affliction he was afflicted and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. Um, Isaiah is a wonderful prophecy. It has some wonderful pictures of what's going to happen in the future, but it also has some devastating pictures of the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I said, God suffers too. Here's the letter to the Hebrews again. It was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things existed, bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery. You see, the example of the Lord Jesus is very instructive. He didn't sin. Anything which happened to Jesus was due to other people. Nothing which happened to him could have in any way be said to be because of what sinful actions he had done because he didn't do anything that was wrong. It wasn't because of his own evil, but because of the wickedness of the world that he died. And that really does take some, some comprehending. It's so powerful that that the suffering perhaps some of the greatest suffering that a man has ever had to undergo was not because of anything that he himself did so when we suffer it's not as a, a direct result of anything that we might have done but simply because things happen to us all and we're all affected to a greater or lesser extent by the uh, by the mortality of our nature we are all likely to suffer because we're part of the human race so a, a little more from the letter to the hebrews still in chapter two again therefore he that's jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect 
so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. So Jesus was made just like us. He suffered. He, he, he had times of uh, pain. Uh, he had times of difficulty, times of anguish, times of suffering. When, when he came to the tomb of his friend Lazarus, we're told he wept. He, he knew what that family were undergoing. And because Jesus has suffered like that, he himself has suffered when tempted. He's able to help those who are tempted. Jesus didn't give in to temptation, as, as we so often do. But he, he went through it, sometimes in the most acute form. So, another New Testament writer, the Apostle Peter, who said, for this you have been, for this, for to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he re was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. That's from 1 Peter chapter 1 and, sorry, chapter 2 and verse 24. So Peter's saying that we must expect to suffer because the one we follow suffered. He, he's given us an example. He didn't sin. He didn't even uh, say anything that was wrong. He didn't come back when people reviled him, as it's so easy to do, isn't it? He didn't threaten when he was suffering. Just trusted the one who judges justly. That, of course, was his heavenly father, the Lord our God. And he bore our sin in his body on the tree. We've been healed by his wounds. So, back to Hebrews again. Hebrews says, And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Nothing that we might say this afternoon about the suffering of Jesus might seem altogether convincing. The fact that we need to ask why is part of the problem of suffering, isn't it? Yet if we detach ourselves from the immediacy of the issues, we might see that suffering is because of the curse that God brought on the earth because of the wickedness of men and women. He's not directly linked to anything specific we may have done or failed to do. But the really good news is that God has planned a day when there won't be any suffering and when it will all come to an end. Uh, we've begun at the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis. Uh, let's end almost with the last chapter of Revelation. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Uh, and this is the bit that really, well, it, it makes me almost cry. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. It was there in the promise that God made to Adam and Eve, right in the Garden of Eden. And the Bible ends with that. We believe that that day is coming very soon. 
one thing about the problem of suffering is we're only going to have to put up with it for a little while yet. <laughs>